about to begin again? Hey, for those of you who are hanging out out there, there are still some free seats in here, too. So if everyone can sit down, we can help identify available seats and, uh, and get everyone seated comfortably in here. Um, is there anyone still out there? Um, yeah, yeah, Gavin, if you could round up who's ever out there and bring them in here, we'd, we'd appreciate this. Because um, obviously, very stimulating uh, conversation here. We want to keep it going. So I'm going to go ahead and um, invite uh, my colleague Swapna Pathak uh, to come up to um, introduce our next, uh, our next panelists. Thank you, John. I don't know if I'm sounding on this mic or this mic, so uh, my apologies there. OK, great. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I think we got a great segue from the previous session into this one, and uh, we'll continue to dig deeper into capitalism and how to think about integrating it with ecological systems. Um, it's really my honor and privilege to be moderating this session with some great speakers. Um, I teach a class on environment and society, and I use works by all the three speakers that you would hear today, which really talks to the fundamental and critical nature of the work they do. Um, so the way we planned out this particular session is that we are going the conventional route, which is that each uh, speaker uh, would come and introduce and talk about these big, deep topics for 15 minutes. And <laughs> And then uh, we will try to open up uh, the panel for a Q&A from the audience. So um, let me start by giving a brief introduction to our first speaker, Dr. Robert Costanza, who's a leading ecological economist of our time. He is currently professor and chair in public policy at the Crawford School of Public Policy. He has held several academic positions prior to this, including Distinguished University Professor of Sustainability in the Institute of Sustainable Solutions at Portland State University, and many other institutions like University of Maryland and Louisiana State University. Uh, Bob's transdisciplinary research integrates the study of humans and the rest of nature to address research, policy, and management issues at multiple time and space scales from small watersheds to the global system. He has authored or co-authored over 500 scientific papers and 27 books. Uh, his work has been cited in, mo in more than 17,000 scientific articles, and he's been named as one of the ISI's highly cited researchers since 2004. Bob is co-founder and past president of the International Society for Ecological Economics, and was chief editor of the society's journal, Ecological Economics, from its inception. So I welcome Bob. Thank you for that kind introduction. I hope that doesn't come out of my 15 minutes, so. Um, can you all hear me? Are we good? No. Is this one on? There we go. OK, that's better. So, yes, um, 15 minutes is not nearly enough time to, to cover all of this, but I thought what I'd do is, is try to put some ideas on the table um, and to get us thinking and, then, and to, to share our conversation. And we heard from Richard, <clears throat> you know, that um, there, there's some pretty, pretty dire potential news out there, uh, these inconvenient truths, but this is not the movie that most people are lining up to go see. 
So part of what we want to talk about is how do we create a third movie? Uh, how do we create a movie that's really focused on, or a new narrative, as, as uh, Hunter is going to call it, that's really focused on a sustainable and desirable economy in society in nature? And maybe that's the way to sum up what ecological economics is all about. You know, to recognize that the economy is <clears throat> um, embedded in, in society and embedded in the rest of nature. <clears throat> and um, maybe to pick up on what the uh, the previous panel was talking about, I think we need to think about the economy as a natural system. Not that we know how natural systems function already, but we can't think of it as something unnatural. It's kind of part of this larger uh, system that we have to understand the whole system <clears throat> in, an, in an integrated way and bring to bear everything that we know and are, and are constantly learning about the system in a, in a very adaptive way. So how do we do that? Well, I think part of the problem is that we are, in a very real sense, addicted to our current growth at all costs economic paradigm, the conventional uh, paradigm, uh, to fossil fuels, to overconsumption, et cetera. <clears throat> what, is, what do we mean by addiction? Um, well, in a general sense, it's um, you're getting very positive short-term rewards from something that has long-term negative consequences. And we're not seeing those long-term negative consequences adequately enough <clears throat> to change our behavior. We're, we're sort of stuck in this pattern of behavior. And I think individuals can be addicted, but also whole societies can be addicted. <clears throat> and you know, in evolutionary theory, you know, other systems can become addicted. You can have evolutionary dead ends, species go extinct, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I think we need to better understand how to escape that, um, that addiction if we really want to change the system and make the transformation into something, something better. Um, <clears throat> so how do we do that? Well, the worst thing you can say to an addict, an individual addict, is you're doing the wrong thing. You've got to stop doing it. You know, that gets a very defensive, denial kind of reaction. And that's the kind of reaction we are getting from, from society. Not that it's not true you know, uh, in both cases. But how do, we, how do we overcome that? Well, I think one way, and I'll get a little into this a little bit more, is to, um, to really focus on envisioning this more sustainable and desirable future that focuses on quality of life and well-being rather than consumption alone. Um, how do we create this, this new narrative, this new story? And I think that positive vision can motivate people uh, to change in the proper direction. So we know that there are planetary boundaries that we've begun to exceed already, climate change, biodiversity loss, the bio. The, uh, the nitrogen cycle, we're probably already outside the safe operating space. You've probably seen some version of this, of this diagram before. Um, we also know that within that, those safe boundaries, we need to create the elements of well-being and quality of life. How do we get, how do we get into the, and stay in the donut, as, as it's called? So we have to balance out <clears throat> those, those imperatives. Um, uh, ecological economics is based on these three fundamental goals or, or questions. Uh, that it tries to address in an integrated way. How do we create an ecologically sustainable scale? How do we stay within those planetary boundaries? How do we have a socially fair distribution of resources, not only within the current generation of humans, but also between the current generation and future generations, and between humans and other species? <clears throat> so equity, fairness has always been a fundamental part of ecological economics. Um, you know, uh, sustainability, uh, planetary boundaries has always been a fundamental part. And finally, how do we have an economically efficient allocation of resources? And that goes well beyond using the market as our only allocation mechanism. It, it requires that we incorporate all of the things that contribute to human well-being and, and how we allocate those, those sort of assets. So it includes natural capital, social capital, all of the things that are outside the market, as well as the things that are, that are currently inside the market, <clears throat> if we really want the system to be efficient. Obviously, our current system is not efficient, it's certainly not fair, and it's, and it's certainly not sustainable. So we need to make this transformation uh, into this new system quite quickly. Um, there have been some significant positive steps, I think, in this direction. Most notably, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Who's heard of these before? Almost everyone in this room, okay. <clears throat> so um, I hope you agree this is, this is a really significant uh, step in human history, never before have has everyone, all governments on the planet, have signed on to, to these 17 goals. Of course, there's 17 goals in 17 different silos, and there's 169 indicate tar targets and 300 indicators. And so 
I think there's still a lot more work to do, but you know, they go far beyond simply maximizing GDP growth. Uh, there is still economic growth as one of them, but at least it's, it's modified as inclusive and sustainable. They couldn't quite change it to prosperity or something other than growth, but I know that was tried <laughs> in the process. <laughs> so there's still a ways to go, but still, that's only one out of 17, and includes you know, reducing poverty and hunger and, and health and education, and, and, uh, and the uh, inequality is, is addressed in there. Several of them relate directly to the environment, action on climate change, you know, preserving marine and terrestrial resources, uh, peace and justice. So <clears throat> a, good, a good collection there. Um, however, I think the next step is really to understand how these different goals interact with each other. Uh, they're obviously all connected. Uh, that's the first principle of, of ecology, as John, John mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and how they uh, aggregate up to, um, to, to reaching this overarching goal. Um, and I think this is what we re need to refocus our society on. We want a prosperous, high quality of life that's equitably shared and sustainable. We want all of those things. Uh, that requires sustainable scale, fair distribution, efficient allocation. It requires, in addition, all of these more detailed goals uh, to be met. But a better understanding also of how they all interact with each other. So I need, we, we need a, a more dynamic <clears throat> uh, understanding. We need to understand this as, a, as an integrated system. And I think that's, that's where we need to go. Um, we, need to know, we need to recognize that all four of these basic types of assets or capital contribute to sustainable human well-being, <clears throat> and they're all required in a more balanced way to pr produce that well-being. So in the past, we've been focusing on built capital. You know, when we say capital, that's usually what is meant by capital, built capital, infrastructure, roads, uh, houses. <clears throat> human capital um, is... is often part of the, the equation, uh, because it's talking about individual people, their education, their health, uh, their labor, uh, at least in the past. Um, we need to focus much more also on social capital, all of the interactions between people, all of our formal and informal networks, our institutions, our culture. You know, the market itself is a form of social capital. Uh, but the culture, more generally, <coughs> is, uh, is, is social capital. And natural capital, everything else in the system uh, that we didn't, didn't have to make, all of our natural ecosystems. That, and they, these all are required in some more balanced interaction to produce sustainable well-being. So the new economy, <clears throat> I think, an ecological economy, really needs to look at how all of these assets interact over time, over space, in different situations. And how do we measure sustainable well-being? What is it we're really trying to, to achieve? Um, this idea, I think, is, is uh, getting some traction in maybe some unexpected places. Uh, this is the president of, of China. Xi Xiaoping, Xi Jinping. Um, <clears throat> and these are some quotes from a recent uh, speech of his, and where they're talking about in China creating an ecological civilization. So I think it's kind of headed in the direction that we're talking about. Good ecological environment is the most universal common good, the most universal aspect of people's well being. <clears throat> and he would rather have clear water and green mountains than mountains of silver and gold. Uh, most of the Chinese leadership is trained as engineers, not as lawyers. <clears throat> so I think they, um, they understand maybe some of the dynamics of these complex systems in a way that, that our leadership doesn't. And if they decide, I think, to, to change to creating an ecological civilization rather than maximizing GDP growth, which is what they had been doing, uh, there's a chance that that could happen fairly quickly and could drag the rest of the world along with it. Um, I also wanted to point out maybe some of the other differences between conventional capitalism and ecological economics and uh, focusing on property rights. Um, <clears throat> so these are some characteristics of um, goods and services uh, that you may or may not have seen before that they can be either rival or non-rival. Rival goods are things that, you know, the consum their consumption by one person prevents other people from also benefiting. Most market goods are rival <clears throat> um, and they're also excludable. It's possible to to prevent people from benefiting unless they, they pay you. Um, <clears throat> most of the other uh, important components or assets in the system, our natural capital, our social capital, are non rival or non-excludable, or both. Uh, so the market works reasonably well for these kinds of goods, but it doesn't work well for uh, the other types of goods. So we need other kinds of, of institutions. And I think there's been a lot of work in, the, in that area. <clears throat> Eleanor Ostrom uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics a few years ago for her work on, on common property assets and how traditional cultures have 
manage to, uh, to, to deal with, uh, to design institutions for managing commons uh, in a sustainable way. So unlike uh, you know, Garrett Hardin's famous book, The Tragedy of the Commons, was really about the tragedy of open access, of not having property rights at all over these resources, but leaving them open access. So we need institutions that can um, <clears throat> limit access to these resources but, and create property rights, but not on behalf of uh, the private owners and using market mechanisms, but on behalf of the entire community. So for example, uh, we've proposed uh, one way to manage the atmosphere and to deal with the climate crisis is to claim ownership of the atmosphere on behalf of the entire global population. Let's claim the sky. <clears throat> uh, once we've established that the, sky, the atmosphere belongs to all of us uh, communally, uh, then we can begin to use property rights and property um, ownership uh, to begin to claim damages for the, for the uh, disruption of that, of that asset. Um, there's something called the public trust doctrine. I don't know if you've run across that, but it maintains that, that governments have the fiduciary responsibility to protect uh, the commons. There have been a couple of successful court cases recently, one in the Netherlands, um, one in, in Oregon. I think there's ongoing court cases that establish that, yes, that is the case. The government has that responsibility. Um, but how do we sort of force that a little bit more? So the idea here is that we need to get a, a, a civil society movement, actually, going to claim the atmosphere, to claim the sky, and to force. Uh, this is like a, a sample invoice that we could send to ExxonMobil, um, saying Here's, here are the damages. We have this delivered by groups of school children you know, and have big media coverage. Uh, but we begin to just get that idea on board that we all collectively own many of these common assets, not just the atmosphere, the oceans, uh, other ecosystem services um, <clears throat> that, uh, that fit into that, those other categories. <clears throat> So, and another major problem, I think, is how do we get past this sort of addiction to, to GDP growth as our, as our primary goal? And uh, it's, well, <clears throat> it's well past time to leave GDP behind as, a, you know, as, a, as, that, as that primary goal, which it was never designed for. GDP is really only designed to track you know, marketed production and consumption uh, in, the, in the conventional uh, economy. Uh, so, uh, if we want to move to a, uh, an economy based on maximizing well-being, okay, that's one component, uh, but there are many other things that we need to take into account. There's been a lot of research along these lines. I think we're at a point now where we can begin to um, have some, some real movement in that direction, especially with the SDGs in place. You know, how, do we, how do we move in that, that way? I'll give you one example just to show you how much difference this can make. So there's something called the Genuine Progress Indicator, uh, developed initially by Herman Daly and John Cobb. <clears throat> it starts with personal consumption, which is a major component of GDP. It weights it by income distribution, because we know that a dollar's worth of income to a rich person doesn't produce as much additional welfare as a dollar's worth of income to a poor person. If you're talking about welfare instead of income, you've got to worry about how that income is distributed. It adds some things that are left out, household labor, volunteer work. Um, and then it subtracts a bunch of things that probably shouldn't be counted as pluses. Uh, the cost of commuting, automobile accidents, we don't want more crime. So the more crime there is, that doesn't, in GDP terms, that would add to GDP. But in real um, welfare terms, it's, it's not a good thing. And then a whole range of natural capital things that, that we don't want more of. Water pollution, air pollution, noise pollution, et cetera. Um, turns out, and we've done this, this has been done for about 17 countries, including the US. I won't go into the, the details here. You can take a look at this paper if you want to see more about all of the different countries and what's been happening. But we put it all together into this global indicator of GDP per capita, which has been going up, versus GPI per capita globally, which peaked in around 1980 or so. So we've moved from a period of economic growth to a period of uneconomic growth. The economy's growing, it's not really economics on improving uh, welfare or, or well-being. Um, and so in a sense, <clears throat> we need to, to recognize that it doesn't really matter so much what's happening to GDP. We really should be concerned with something a little broader in terms of its, its assessment. And uh, <clears throat> we haven't, the economy has not been growing in real welfare terms you know, since, since 1980 or so. So uh, a couple of states in the US have picked up on this. Uh, the state of Maryland was the first one. Uh, they now have a whole uh, office devoted to calculating their GDP every, every uh, quarter, every year. Uh, so you can take a look and see how they're doing it. <coughs> um, uh, the Vermont also uh, passed this into legislation, so they're required every year to produce a, a GPI account. Um, this is not the last 
uh, the, the last of the story, there's, there's work on you know, GPI 2.0. Uh, part of the problem with the original GPI, it doesn't really, it includes the, the cost, the depletion of natural capital, the cost of pollution, but not the positive services, the ecosystem services being provided. So we need to add that in. We need to add the positive services from human capital and from social capital, as well as the cost of uh, social cost of that economic activity. So I think there's, there's room for a lot more work and research um, in these, these kinds of indicators, but you, know, you get what you measure, so we need to start measuring what we really want. <clears throat> and of course, there will always be deniers in the back of the room. This guy is saying, what if, what if it's a big hoax and create this, we create this better world for nothing? Um, <clears throat> my point is that we need to focus much more on what the better world really looks like and communicate that much more broadly with, uh, with, with the, uh, the public. So uh, back to one of my original points. We have a paper that just came out. I'm happy to share this one with you, if, if you uh, or we can distribute it, that <clears throat> makes the analogy between um, what works at the individual scale for overcoming addictions and what might work you know, at the societal scale. What kind of societal therapy uh, do we need uh, to get from where we are to, I think, where most of us want to be? And there's a process called motivational interviewing that seems to be quite effective at the um, individual scale. And it's based on uh, <clears throat> not confronting the addict, but engaging with the addict, uh, you know, and building relationships, getting a focus on what kind of life they would like, you know, is what they're doing really helping them achieve that, that goal. Uh, focus a little more on the longer term uh, kinds, of, kinds of phenomena and use that as a way to engage them in thinking about what kind of changes could, make, could they make to to get to that, to that better world. So um, at the societal scale, um, our analogy is, well, we need to engage society in this discussion of what a better world looks like. How do we uh, <clears throat> have a discussion about uh, uh, the kind of world that we want? Uh, so envisioning, uh, scenario planning, I think is another exercise. And one example that we're using is uh, this, this uh, public opinion survey that we had just run in Australia, where we have these four possible futures um, if you go to this website, I think it's still active, so if you want to take a look at, at how it works in, in detail. Um, you click on one of these, it describes each of these possible future scenarios out to 2050 for the, for the country. Free enterprise is kind of the business as usual one. There's community well-being, which is more the sustainability, you know, sustainable development goals scenario, a couple of other uh, possibilities. And then we ask them to, um, after they've read about these possible futures, take a survey and rank them and tell us which ones. Uh, they prefer. And we also asked them which one they thought the country was, headed, was in and which, which one they thought it was headed toward. Um, <clears throat> the bottom line is that the vast majority of the respondents, over 70 percent, preferred the well-being, um, community well-being economy uh, or society, uh, fo closely followed by some coordinated action. So this is like more, more government uh, action to control some of these things. Um, but they also thought that they were, the country was in the free enterprise um, scenario and was headed towards the free enterprise scenario. So you get this real uh, divergence between where people want the country to go and where they see it, uh, see it headed. Uh, but having that discussion, I think, is the first step in this kind of societal therapy to, to get a clear consensus on where the, uh, what the goals are uh, for the system. So, um, and I think we also need to publicize much more broadly uh, what some of these solutions might be, and many of the other ones that, uh, that I'm sure you'll be talking about and hearing about at this conference. So, um, who's, who's heard of this journal? Just to give me a, all right, yes. <laughs> Good, so the word is getting out. <laughs> we have a special issue actually on the Oberlin project, um, that there'll be copies of that uh, floating around. Um, but um, you know, our rule of thumb is no more than a third of the articles can be about describing the problem, two thirds about describing the solutions. So a venue for having uh, this kind of discussion, getting these ideas out there. In fact, and I think as Hunter will go into a lot more, more detail, uh, this, the solutions are there. Um, they're just not widely distributed, widely known, widely employed. Uh, and so if we really want to make this transition, we have to focus on what the solutions are, what this better world looks like, and also how we can get there. And we just relaunched our website, so take a look at that, and, uh, and I hope you'll, you'll uh, both read it and contribute to it. Thank you. <laughs>